Legends of Saints and Sinners by Douglas Hyde. Chapter 2. Mary's Well. Preface. The following story I got from Princess Okunchevit when he was in Athlone about 15 years ago, and he heard it from a woman who herself came from Ballantuber, County Mayo. This Ballantuber is not to be confounded with the Ross commonplace of the same name, which is called in Irish Baileon Taber, Oikonchever, or O'Connor's Ballantuber. The Mayo Ballantuber is celebrated for its splendid abbey, founded by one of the Stauntons, a tribe who took the name of Macam Lead, or Mac Evely, in Irish. The prophecy is current in Mayo, that when the abbey is re-roofed and Ireland will be free. My friend, Colonel Maurice Moore, told me that when he was a young boy, he often wondered why people did not roof the abbey, and so free Ireland without any more trouble. The tomb of the notorious Sean Nasagar, the priest hunter, which is not far away from it, is still pointed out by the people. It is probably he who was the spy in the following story, although his name is not mentioned. He belonged to a class who appear to have made it their business to track down priests and friars, which is alluded to in the following lines. It is no use for me to be saying it, seeing your kinship with Donoch of the priest, and with Owen of the cards his father, and with the people who used to cut off heads, to put them into their leather bags, to bring them down with them to the city, and to bring home the gold they got for them, for sustenance for wives and children. It will be noticed that it was Mary Mother who put the curing of the blind into this well, and Owen O'Duffy, the poet, says of her that she is a woman who put a hedge round every country, a woman to whom right inclines, a woman greatest in strength and power, a woman softest, i.e. most generous, about red gold, a woman by whom is quenched the anger of the king, a woman who gives sight to the blind. For the Irish text of the story, see Religious Songs of the Connacht, Volume 1, page 111. The abbey where the old holy well broke out was, according to some, founded by Cathal O'Connor in 1216 for the Augustinians and was dedicated to the Holy Trinity. The Story Long ago, there was a blessed well in Ballantuber, i.e. the town of the well, in the county Mayo. There was once a monastery in the place where the well is now, and it was on the spot where stood the altar of the monastery that the well broke out. The monastery was on the side of a hill, but when Cromwell and his band of destroyers came to this country, they overthrew the monastery, and it never left stone on top of stone in the altar that they did not throw down. A year from the day that they threw down the altar, that was Lady Day in spring, the well broke out on the site of the altar, and it is a wonderful thing to say that there was not one drop of water in the stream that was at the foot of the hill from the day that well broke out. There was a poor friar going the road the same day, and he went out of his way to say a prayer upon the site of the blessed altar, and there was a great wonder on him when he saw a fine well in its place. He fell on his knees and began to say his paternoster, when he heard a voice saying, Put off your brogues, you are upon blessed ground, you are on the brink of Mary's well, and there is a curing of thousands of blind in it. There shall be a person cured by the water of that well for every person who heard mass in front of the altar that was in the place where the well is now, if they be dipped three times in it, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When the friar had his prayers said, he looked up and saw a large white dove upon the fir tree near him. It was the dove who was speaking. The friar was dressed in false clothes, because there was a price on his head, as great as would be on the head of a wild dog or wolf. At any rate, he proclaimed the story to the people of the little village, and it was not long till it went out through the country. It was a poor place, and the people in it had nothing to live in, but huts and these filled with smoke. On that account there were great many weak-eyed people amongst them. With the dawn on the next day, there were above forty people at Mary's Well, and there was never man nor woman of them, but came back with good sight. The fame of Mary's Well went through the country, and it was not long till there were pilgrims from every county coming to it, and nobody went back without being cured. And at the end of a little time, even people from other countries used to be coming to it. There was an unbeliever living near Mary's Well. It was a gentleman he was, and he did not believe in the cure. He said there was nothing in it but pish trogs or charms, and to make a mock of the people, he brought a blind ass that he had to the well, and dipped his head under the water. The ass got its sight, but the scoffer was brought home as blind as the sole of your shoe. And at the end of a year so it happened that there was a priest working as a gardener, with the gentleman who was blind. The priest was dressed like a workman, and nobody at all knew that it was a priest who was in it. One day the gentleman was sickly, and he asked his servant to take him out of the garden. When he came to the place where the priest was working, he sat down. 
isn't it a great pity, says he, that I cannot see my fine garden? The gardener took compassion on him, and said, I know where there is a man who would cure you, but there is a price on his head on account of his religion. I give you my word that I'll do no spying on him, and I'll pay him well for his trouble, said the gentleman. But perhaps you would not like to go through the mode of curing that he has, said the gardener. I don't care what mode he has, if he gives me my sight, said the gentleman. Now, the gentleman had an evil character, because he betrayed a number of priests before that. Bingham was the name that was on him. However, the priest took courage and said, Let your coach be ready on tomorrow morning, and I will drive you to the place of the cure. Neither coachman nor anyone else may be present but myself, and do not tell to any one at all where you are going, or give any one a knowledge of what is your business. On the morning of the next day, Bingham's coach was ready, and he himself got into it, with the gardener driving him. Do you remain at home this time, says he to the coachman, and to the gardener will drive me. The coachman was a villain, and there was a jealousy on him. He conceived the idea of watching the coach to see what way they were to go. His blessed vestments were on the priest, inside of his other clothes. When they come to Mary's well, the priest said to him, I am going to get back your sight for you in the place where you lost it. Then he dipped him three times in the well, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and his sight came to him as well as ever it was. I'll give you a hundred pounds, said Bingham, as soon as I go home. The coachman was watching, and as soon as he saw the priest in his blessed vestments, he went to the people of the law and betrayed the priest. He was taken and hanged without judge, without judgment. The man who was after getting back his sight could have saved the priest, but he did not speak a word on his behalf. About a month after the priest came to Bingham, and he dressed like a gardener, and he asked the work of Bingham and got it from him. But he was not long in his service until an evil thing happened to Bingham. He went out one day, walking through his fields, and there met him, a good-looking girl, the daughter of a poor man, and he assaulted her and left her half dead. The girl had three brothers, and they took an oath that they would kill him as soon as they could get a hold of him. They had not long to wait. They caught him in the same place where he assaulted the girl and hanged him on a tree and left him there hanging. On the morning of the next day, millions of flies were gathered like a great hill round about the tree, and nobody could go near it on account of the foul smell that was round the place, and anyone who would go near it, the midges would blind them. Bingham's wife and son offered a hundred pounds to anyone who would bring out the body. A good many people made an effort to do that, but they were not able. They got dust to shake on the flies, and boughs of trees to beat them with, but they were not able to scatter them, nor to go as far as the tree. The foul smell was getting worse, and the neighbours were afraid that the flies and noisome corpse would bring a plague upon them. The second priest was at this time a gardener with Bingham, but the people of the house did not know that it was a priest who was in it, for if the people of the law or the spies knew, they would take and hang him. The Catholics went to Bingham's wife and told her that they knew a man who would banish the flies. Bring him to me, she said, and if he is able to banish the flies, that is not the reward he'll get, but seven times as much. But, said they, if the people of the law knew, they would take him and hang him, as they hung the man who got back sight of his eyes for him before. But, said she, could not he banish the flies without the knowledge of the people of the law? We don't know, said they, until they take counsel with him. That night they took counsel with the priest and told him what Bingham's wife said. I have only an earthly life to lose, said the priest, and I shall give it up for the sake of the poor people, for there will be a plague in the country unless I banish the flies. On tomorrow morning I shall make an attempt to banish them in the name of God, and I have hope and confidence in God that he will save me from my enemies. Go to the lady now and tell her that I shall be near the tree at sunrise tomorrow morning, and tell her to have many ready to put the corpse in the grave. They went to the lady and told her all the priest said. If it succeeds with him, said she, I shall have the reward ready for him, and I shall order seven men to be present. The priest spent that night in prayer, and half an hour before sunrise he went to the place where his blessed vestments were hidden. He put these on, and with a cross in one hand and the holy water in the other, he went to the place where were the flies. He then began reading out of his book and scattering the holy water on the flies, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The hill of flies rose and flew up in the air, and made the heaven as dark as night. The people did not know where they went, but at the end of half an hour there was not one of them to be seen. 
There was a great joy on the people, but it was not long till they saw the spy coming, and they called to the priest to run away as quick as it was in him to run. The priest gave to the butts, took to his heels, and the spy followed him, and a knife in each hand with him. When he was not able to come up with the priest, he flung the knife after him. As the knife was flying out past the priest's shoulder, he put up his left hand and caught it, and without ever looking behind him, he flung it back. It struck the man and went through his heart, so that he fell dead, and the priest went free. The people got the body of Bingham and buried it in the grave, but when they went to bury the body of the spy, they found thousands of rats round about it, and there was not a morsel of flesh on his bones that they had not eaten. They would not stir from the body, and the people were not able to rout them away, so that they had to leave the bones overground. The priest hid away his blessed vestments, and was working in the garden, when Bingham's wife sent for him, and told him to take the reward that was for banishing the flies, and to give it to the man who banished them, if he knew him. I do know him, and he told me to bring him the reward to-night, because he has the intention of leaving the country before the law people hang him. Here it is for you, she said as she handed him a purse of gold. On the morning of the next day, the priest went to the brink of the sea and found a ship that was going to France. He went on board, and as soon as he had left the harbour, he put his priest's clothes on and gave thanks to God for bringing him safe. We do not know what happened to him from that out. After that, blind and sore-eyed people used to be coming to Mary's well, and not a person of them ever returned without being cured. But there never yet was anything good in this country that was not spoilt by somebody, and the well was spoilt in this way. There was a girl in Ballantuber, and she was about to be married, when there came a half-blind old woman in her asking alms in the honour of God and Mary. "'I've nothing to give to an old blind thing of a hag. It's bothered with them I am,' said the girl. "'The marriage ring may never go on you till you're as blind as myself,' says the old woman." Next day in the morning the young girl's eyes were sore, and the morning after that she was nearly blind, and the neighbours said to her that she ought to go to Mary's well. In the morning early she rose up and went to the well, but what should she see at it but the old woman who asked alms of her, sitting on the brink, combing her hair over the blessed well. "'Destruction on you, you nasty hag! Is it dirtying Mary's well you are?' said the girl. "'Get out of that, or I'll break your neck!' You have no honour nor regard for God or Mary. You refuse to give up alms in honour of them, and for that reason you shall not dip yourself in the well. The girl caught a hold of the hag, trying to pull her from the well. With the dragging that was between them, the two of them fell into the well and were drowned. From that day to this, there has been no cure in the well. End of chapter 2